really great pleasure to have Dirk Smeets uh, speaking to us, who is the Chief Technology Officer of Icometrics in uh, Leuven, Belgium. Uh, he um, is um, really driven by helping patients through digital tools, and Icometrics has been quite leading in um, uh, such uh, AI tools for MS, dementia, traumatic brain injury, uh, epilepsy and stroke. Um, and um, he's also an advisor and reviewer for the European Commission, visiting researcher at Brussels and Amps, uh, Antwerp universities. And um, he has 17 patents and has brought eight medical devices to the market. So if you're thinking about translation and think back to David Baker's talk earlier on, here's your man. Dirk. Thank you, thank you, uh, Professor Schmier. Uh, thank you also, Laura and Jiwon, for uh, the invitation to speak here. It's a it's a real honor to be part of the of this amazing program. Uh, and I'm eat uh, perhaps a little bit the person with a, a different background here, especially when looking at the project. I see that um, basically everyone is a professor or a lecturer. Um, yeah, and I'm probably the geek in the, in the group here. Um, I did my PhD in something probably very geeky for all of you, is uh, trying to match 3D shapes. Uh, and I did that to bring them into a high dimensional curved space because it was cooler for the mathematics there. Um, but on the other hand, also, um, I'm passionate about helping people, uh, trying with technology to help people. And this is, uh, this is my, my dad, uh, who, is, uh, who is currently in the hospital um, with an unknown neurological condition. And yeah, a lot of challenges in getting the diagnostics for him. Uh, and that's also, again, a reminder for myself why we're doing what we're doing uh, at Tychometrics, trying with AI to help, help people uh, with neurological conditions. And for Tychometrics, the story actually started for neurological reporting. Here is the first neurological report um, from 1896 um, about uh, an X-ray of a kidney. And when we started to build our products, um, I went into a PAC system and an EMR system to look how the radiological reports looked for people with the mass. And basically, unfortunately, that's 120 years later, but it's still qualitative. Um, there is, in this case, many 2T, T2 hyperintense lesions and also mo uh, moderate and global cortical atrophy. So clinical decision-making in neurology is not really data-driven yet, especially not if you look at it from a global perspective. As Professor Zachary already mentioned it, but I think indeed not everyone is being treated in a highly uh, advanced academic center. Um, we see that, of course, the clinical assessment, they have high variability. The radiological reporting, 24% contain major discrepancies. Image quality is often too poor to properly detect lesions. Uh, the time to, do, to get um, before disease activity is detected is, is for, uh, in some situations, up to four years. 60 to 90% of neurologists have challenges with therapeutic inertia. It's also referring to the, uh, the talk of David Baker earlier. So 25% um, are on a suboptimal treatment or start on a suboptimal treatment. So you see there are still a lot of challenges. And the question we ask ourselves is how can AI help in that? Before trying to answer that, I want to take a step back first and look and share with you how I think uh, AI is working and what AI is able to do in the what is good, what's bad about it, and maybe also what's a little bit dirty. But for the, before that, um, I want to start with some definitions, because uh, AI is being used in many contexts, but AI is generally just a technique which enables machines to, to mimic human behavior. It's something that is not really new, I, I guess, because it's, it's been done since computers are existing. A subfield of AI is machine learning. In machine learning, we teach an, uh, um, an algorithm, a computer, to, uh, to do a task 
based on giving training data. And recently, deep learning has been uh, coming up where specific neural networks are being trained that have containing multiple layers and get some level of complexity that is not so easy anymore to, to understand intuitively. So as mentioned, AI is not a recent thing. Uh, actually, it starts already in the, in the 50s. But why it's so important nowadays is because of the latest years, deep learning is, is coming into our, into our society, uh, not only in medicine, but also outside of that. The earliest publication I could find on neural networks was in radiology in 1963. Uh, so just to indicate that it's, that it's not recent. But what has changed since then is computational power. Uh, this is more or less at the time that the Apollo missions were there, end of the year 60s. Um, and just to give an idea, the total computational capacity to get the Apollo mission being launched and being su successfully executed is the same or is even less than just one single Google search. And if you think about the new Bing, for example, or other advanced uh, search machines that go way beyond that computational capacity. So that has been changed a lot since, since, uh, since the past decades, and that opens up opportunities. But just back to what, what neural networks are. Some people might think these are very complex things that look like the human brain. Yeah, maybe there is some inspiration with the human brain, but in fact, neural networks are just linear algebra. It's matrix vector, vector products. Uh, so basically what you, what you have been taught at school earlier, but then at a very large scale. What's also interesting is that these operations can be executed very efficiently with GPUs, graphical processing units. These have been also developed in the last years, giving again opportunities that were not there before. So that is all factors that contribute to why AI is now entering our healthcare systems and our, and our communities. So just to explain how it works. This is a very simple neural network. It has an input layer, it has a hidden layer in the middle, and an output layer on the right. Data goes in. Uh, for example, imaging data is very interesting because it's quite structured. Uh, it goes in. There is quite some math that happens. Again, linear algebra. And then a certain prediction is made. Uh, just on the definitions, the edges we call weights, and the uh, the circles we call the neurons of the neural network. If we take an example of lesion detection or lesion segmentation, it is looking like this. So there is an image uh, of a brain with a lesion inside, that little uh, image we call a patch, and it contains all different numbers that just go into the neural network, and then there is, a, there is some math happening, and there is an output. Um, either it's a lesion or it's not a lesion. What we want, the the neural network to learn is that the number that is on top is high and the number that is on the bottom is, is, is low. And that is actually what happens during the training phase of a neural network. If we do that at patch level, we call that computer-aided detection. If we do that at pixel level or voxel level, if we talk, with 3D, talk about 3D images, that's called image segmentation. So, that is what we call predictive AI. You start with an image, and you ask the AI algorithm what it is, and it tries to predict what it is. In this case, we have an example of a lesion patch, and it asks what kind of, uh, whether it's a lesion or not, and if it predicts it well, it says it's a lesion. Now, what's particularly interesting in the last years is also the other way around. So we start with the outcome, like I want an MS lesion in the corpus callosum, for example, and you get the image of an uh, uh, MS image with a lesion in the corpus callosum. This is called generative AI. Um, in imaging, it's not working that well. I tried it with an, um, with an open source uh, neural network, and that's the result. So it's not really uh, working because it requires the right training data, of, of course. A space where this is working very, very well is when the input data are language models, are languages human language, that's called a language model. So you probably know it from your phone, when you're typing, uh, it suggests a certain word. These are the simple ways of predicting language, uh, generating language based on um, your previous language. 
Of course, if you're going to apply that at scale, that's something that has been happening recently. In December 22, OpenAI, it's a company, has launched ChatGTP. You probably heard about it, and it's, it's really impacting what we're doing. And it's not only OpenAI that's doing it. Uh, Google came up with their own large language model called Bard AI, um, Microsoft with New Bing, and uh, also recently, in all, all in uh, earlier this year, Meta, uh, previously called Facebook, has Llama as their large language model. And there has been a lot of publications around that in the last months. Uh, for example, in February, the ChatGTP passes the US medical license exam. Then in April, uh, a newer version uh, improved, uh, especially with flying colors. Then there was also an article that ChatGTP was rated better than real doctors for empathy, something we thought that computers were not good at, right? Uh, ChatGTP Chat was also able to answer patients' questions online better than real doctors, another study fans. Um, also, uh, it improves further, um, but of course with some limitations. Also, on very complex medical cases, it's also outperforming uh, medical students. Just some of the articles where success has been claimed for ChatCTP. Of course, I want to say here uh, an important thing. ChatCTP is, is, is not uh, something that can logically re uh, reason. It is something that has been trained on the training data it has, it has been given. And that is very important to understand. So if we give it garbage, garbage gets out. Of course, uh, these, these language models have been trained on the whole internet, so there is a lot of useful information in there. But there are some uh, parts that we should be aware of. Um, for example, the internet has been trained um, with all the history of the internet, right? Uh, today, we have, for example, a, gender, a better gender balance than we had in the past. But the internet is full of things from the past. What did the people from ChatGTP thought about it? They thought like, oh, we built a model that's called G GPT, and we add a chat on there where there is some additional ethical layer on top of that, and we just filter it. But if we try to hack those filters, for example, with uh, the question to ChatGTP to write a Python function, who is a good scientist based on a JSON description of race and gender? This passed the filter of ChatGTP, and then it says a good scientist is defined as if the race is white and the gender is male, it's a good scientist, else it's not a good scientist. So this is really what's in the model. Of course, it's hidden because these ethical layers, but that is just pointing to a certain risk of using these models. That's an inherent bias based on the training data. Another example of generative AI is DAL-E. DAL-E is a, a generative AI algorithm that can generate images. Another um, example of how misrepresented the outcomes are. For example, if you ask DAL-E to generate an image of a, of a doctor, it has uh, also more chance to represent a male doctor. Whereas in practice, um, women make up 39% of doctors in the US, but in Dal E, it's only 7%. Again, that gender bias is there. This is just one single example. There are many more examples of these. And that's something to, um, to be aware of when, when using those models. Back to predictive AI, as that's also something that is closer to use in clinical routine setting, uh, because these generative models have still some unknown factors, people don't really understand them well, even the experts are not really understanding them. But with predictive AI, there is. There is something wrong in, with this algorithm, and not sure if anyone has seen what is wrong in this algorithm. It's an algorithm that tries to distinct between a wolf and a husky. So the first image, it was right. Second, right. Third, right. Uh, fourth, fifth. But you see, two times it went wrong. It sets uh, a husky uh, for the bottom, the second on the left, and uh, also the second on the right. Uh, it was wrong. But basically, what, if you look at these images well, you see there is a certain feature that was very deterministic for the outcome of the, of the, uh, the algorithm. And basically, that was the presence of snow in the image. So basically, instead of learning whether it's a wolf 
or a husky, it learned if it's snow in the image, it will be a wolf, and if there's no snow in the image, it will be a husky. Again, another important factor that if you don't use the right training data, it will learn the wrong thing. So these are some of the aspects of AI where we should be careful for. Of course, there are some good examples, and I hope to also share with you what we have at Icometrics have tried to do to build some good AI algorithms, especially in the field of multiple sclerosis. So coming back to why we're actually doing this at Icometrics, I mentioned earlier there are several parts of the care pathway today that we feel are not data-driven, and we asked ourselves the question, could AI help? So the first and probably quite simple way of doing it is by segmenting and quantifying images. It makes the images already more quantified and therefore more data-driven decisions can be based on them because there is data available. And to do so, we have developed um, an algorithm that we called IcoBrain, and IcoBrain generates these uh, annotated scans. It also generates these quantitative reports in which uh, certain uh, important clinically relevant uh, parameters from the scan are derived from. And it also generates a pre-populated reporting template because we thought it helps in uh, standardizing the care um, and making the radiological reporting more homogeneous. So just to give like some more details, uh, it measures flare lesions, it measures uh, T1 black holes, it gets enhancing lesions, measures the brain volumes, and also we can, we can, because we can measure, we can also compare it. In both scenarios, we compare with populations. For example, the lesions we can compare with an MS population, uh, the brain, brain volumes we can also compare with an MS, po an MS population, or we can compare also with normal aging. And that gives some context that helps to understand um, the image better. Again, this is not meant to be um, a commercial talk about icometrics, but I want to share what is underneath uh, the surface there, underneath these algorithms. Basically, we started um, back in the days that deep learning was not entered the field in, uh, in, um, in medicine yet. It seems a long time ago, but in 2010, when, 2011, when we were founded, there was no deep learning being applied in medical imaging yet. So we started with what is called unsupervised machine learning. This has a big advantage because in unsupervised machine learning, as opposed to deep learning, we better understand what the algorithms are doing. So basically, we designed an algorithm where we knew step for step what the algorithm was supposed to do. We thought of like, oh, let's use a T1 scan to understand where the white matter, the gray matter, and the CSF is, and we use the flare scan to understand where the lesions are. We did that with something that is called outlier detection. Something that is strange that you don't expect there, we call it a lesion. So that has been working reasonably well, but of course it could not use the full power of these deep learning algorithms. What is important here, because it's unsupervised machine learning, this has no risk of overfitting like deep learning approaches have, and therefore it has been safe to say, and cannot do that unexpected behavior that we have seen, for example, with, with some of the algorithms before. But of course, then uh, deep learning came, and we have added also deep learning in there. Uh, you can see a graph here, um, which are much more complex networks than the network that I show. Each block is a full convolutional layer, and that's convolution is a specific operation that can do uh, kind of a filtering of the image. And the filtering allows to detect, for example, edges in the image. It uh, uh, allows to detect corners. And the deeper you go, the more filters you apply, it can find certain structures. For example, if you would do it for face recognition, you have the same edges, uh, corners. But at certain moment, in a deeper layer, you can find noses, you can find ears. And that is very similar that we can do here on the MRI scans. So the deeper we go, the more context the algorithm knows. Of course, that's in a very like, non-visualizable space, so we need to go back up, and that's called the decoding part, to also try to visualize it and to get the segmentation down. Of course, as mentioned, um, this is not always working, because the data that we feed into it is not necessarily representative of the data that we see in the real world practice. It's the same example as what we used on the, with the gender imbalance. 
So the lesions that we might detect here in a certain scanner might not be exactly the ones that we want to detect for another scanner. And that's why we use actually the same principle as that chat CTP is currently using. It's called human reinforcement learning. Basically, there is a feedback loop in it. You ask the human to correct the AI, and based on the corrections, the AI can retrain. Of course, it's not done continuously, because in this case, it's a medical device, it's regulated, it cannot be, have continuous updates. But that is how we have tried to make it more robust to real-world differences. And that has led to what the algorithm is today, as you can see, a lot of super cool graphs that are just a lot of math uh, below that can do the segmentations of the different structures and the lesions. Uh, it's called an ensemble method. You, so you use different networks that are competing against each other to also kind of balance the, the, the good, the bad, and the ugly from the different networks. So that was uh, one example of how we can use AI in multiple sclerosis, and specifically for imaging. Another question that we ask ourselves is, can we predict an EDSS score based on an image? It's something that you can just take an image, you, use, you train a network, and you ask, can you predict the EDSS score? Probably you as neurologists think, like, hmm, likely this is not really possible, but let the data scientists do. I can already say, yes, it's a very nice project for data scientists to practice, but probably not so useful in clinical routine setting. It, uh, what you use for that is something that is called a ResNet. It's different than the network that I showed before. This is a network that doesn't have that decoding phase, the upgoing phase again, but just goes to one single number, which is the conclusion, uh, and was very similar to what I showed earlier on the lesion versus no lesion. So we have tried that, and we compared that with the statistical um, statistical methods or random force, traditional machine learning, and it gives better results. But the error on the EDSS score is probably way too big to make it clinically useful. And the reason for that is likely more to be sought in the EDSS score, maybe not the most reproducible outcome parameter, rather than the algorithm's not so, not so strong. Another aspect that we're working on, and I think it's one of the questions that was also asked in the, uh, in the talk of on Swindle on subtyping as uh, the endal phenotypes, but uh, there is also something we can do on MRI scans, uh, subtyping. There will be a talk this afternoon about it from Arman Ashagi, um, who found that we can use these biomarkers that we extract from the images with these segmentation and quantification approaches, and you can push that again into another network, another uh, AI algorithm, and it tries to find distinct patterns of evolution. I'm sure that Arman will explain it much better than I'm currently doing, but what is super exciting about his results is that some populations seem to respond better to certain treatments or not. Again, not the scope of, the, the, of my talk here, but one of, the working, one, of, one of the elements that we are trying to do is try to translate that into a more robust setting, because these findings were done on real world, are not done on real world data, but were done on nice clinical trial data. So what we have tried to do is look for alternative biomarkers that, is a bit, that are a bit more robust to capture the variability in the real world. And we found similar patterns. So we, have, we are very hopeful that at some day, these great results on the subtypes based on the MRI can also be applied in a clinical routine setting. By the way, we have an open posi uh, PhD position together with uh, UCL on this particular topic in trying to translate these subtypes into clinical routine, clinical routine set. Another uh, AI algorithm that we're working on, and I also want to highlight, is what's called the topographical model. Actually, the topographical model has nothing to do with AI. It's something that uh, Professor Krieger in uh, Mount Sinai has come up with as a theoretical model on how the disease is evolving and how that can be visualized on MRI. He has uh, used the, the metaphor of a, a bath where there are some peaks that represent the relapses or the lesions. So the peak is seen as, the, as a lesion. Uh, the atrophy can be seen as the brain reserve, the water level that can drop if there is accelerated atrophy. And uh, there's a certain clinical threshold before, before a relapse becomes, uh, before a lesion becomes a clinical relapse. So that's the theory that has been thought out by Professor Krieger. 
But what is interesting is that this are, these are concepts that we can quantify and put into a model. And that's also interesting to make sure that we don't overfit, because there is some theoretical knowledge behind it. If we implement the theoretical knowledge, we have less chance of overfitting. And that's why um, we have come up with something that we call the lesion parenchymal fraction. That's the amount of lesion volume in a certain region divided by the parenchymal volume in that region as a representation of whether a lesion becomes uh, apparent or not. That is, of course, taking the output of the algorithms again into account, and this appears to be a good representation of Professor Krieger's model and helps also to, uh, to, pr to estimate the, the, the transition from relapsing remitting to progressive MS. This is still some active field of research, so we're not there yet, but this is looking quite promising in terms of how to better describe the dynamics of the disease in a computational manner. The last point of, of, the, of my talk, I want to also discuss a little bit what it takes to get those AI algorithms into clinical routine setting. As it was also referred to in some of the earlier presentations, we can do a lot of great stuff in research, but what we actually want to do is we help, want to help patients. And uh, David Baker showed also the, the graphs of the, the uptake of the CD20, anti-CD20 therapies in, in, in centers, and there is a large divergence. Basically the same is also there for AI. And what it takes to take it into a clinical routine setting, I tried to compare AI with a disease-modifying treatment. Although it's completely different, I took here just the example of uh, Ocrevus uh, that has been entering the market, I think, 2016, 2017 where a clinical validation is required before the regulatory filing. You have the phase three trials uh, for relapsing remitting MS and progressive MS on uh, the number of subjects that you have, you can see there. Then it goes to the FDA, to the center of drug uh, evaluation, uh, to the EMA, and here in the UK to the MHRA. That is different for AI. AI has also been tested. Just to give you an idea, IcoBrain is tested on 3,500 3, subjects, more or less, and also in an additional reader study uh, for, uh, for 200 patients. It goes there also to the FDA, but it's a different body within the FDA. In Europe, it goes to a notified body as opposed to the AMA, and also in the UK, it goes to an approved body rather than the MHRA directly. Workflow is also different. This is an IT product. It's not something that requires a supply chain to bring the drug to the patient. Uh, so that is also something you need to think about when onboarding the AI into clinical routine setting. Also, what is especially important for AI are the in-use validation studies. Once the AI is implemented, you want to make sure that indeed care is being improved. Um, in, in pharmaceutical trials, these are often looked at as the phase four trial or the real world evidence trials. There is a lot of research being done there, but also a lot of the uh, data is coming from the rigorous phase three trials. In AI, that's different because these AI algorithms, they have a lifetime of just a couple of months, uh, so they change all the time. That's not the case with, uh, with drugs. So that's why these in-use validation studies are so important. And then it's, of course, important, and that's what I want to uh, later end the presentation with, is to make sure that clinicians are adopting it in a clinical routine, where um, for, for the CD20 therapies or, in general, the high-efficacy therapies, we probably struggle with therapeutic inertia, whereas in, in AI, we struggle with something that's called the technology adoption life cycle. I'll come to that later. First, going through the some of the elements, what it takes to get into it. I mentioned already IT integration. This is a horrible graph for most of you probably, but this is the graph that we need to take and discuss with the IT management to get the AI algorithm into the clinical routine setting. So as you can imagine, that can give some headaches. But if it works, it can also work very nicely. Uh, so here is an example of where it's nicely integrated into uh, the clinical routine setting uh, where the uh, the clinicians can just see the alerts that are seen by the, uh, by the algorithm and uh, the reports are just available. Let's see if the movie's working. So there is, for example, this is a 
in a Portuguese center, that's why it's in Portuguese. Uh, so you can see the automatic uh, text that is generated is nicely already sitting there when the radiologist starts the reading. And he has also access to the quantitative reports. As mentioned, another aspect that is super important are the in-use validation. And from that perspective, I also definitely want to mention uh, a study that we're currently conducting here in the UK under uh, the lead of uh, Professor Schmier, which is called the assist -MS study, where we're going to test whether indeed uh, icobrain ms has a positive impact on detecting disease activity and patient outcomes in the NHS set setting, looking at resources, uh, looking at patient outcomes, and so on, to better understand what it, what it means in a clinical routine setting. Okay, to finalize, I also want to look at some barriers, some barriers for physician adoption. Um, it's not really my field, but when reading the literature, I see that in adopting DMTs, there is something that's called therapeutic inertia. And I was super surprised to, to see the amounts reported in literature. As 60 to 90% of MS specialists are impacted by therapeutic inertia and contributing to suboptimal decision-making in, in one out of every five therapeutic decisions. Where, ther where therapeutic inertia is defined as the absence of treatment initiation or intensification when therapeutic goals are not met. So this is something that plays, of course, uh, for disease-modifying treatments. There is something similar that happens with technology in general. And this is one of my favorite books. It's called Crossing the Chasm. It is actually looking how, from the human behavioral perspective, technology is adopted. Um, and you can see different parts of the market, parts of the uh, user's population, from tech enthusiasts. These are people that like to use technology just for the sake of technology. You have the early adopters are the visionaries that see a lot of value in the AI for their own practice and believe that this is really making them uh, a better clinician in this case. And then there is something that is behind the chasm, which is the called in business terms, the mainstream market, consisting of pragmatists, conservatives, and skeptics. And what is the fundamental problem in technology adoption? And that's not just for AI in medicine, but just general for technology to be adjust, adopted uh, broadly, is that pragmatists, from the human behavioral perspective, only buy or use the technology when other pragmatists use it. So that is what is a catch-22 situ situation, right? So this is one of the main problems in uh, technology adoption. What is, the, what is uh, important there, and that's why these in-use validation studies are so important, these are told to be uh, helping to cross the chasm and to also reach the mainstream uh, market. I want to illustrate this, uh, this behavior uh, with with a little movie. Uh, this is a movie that has been taken uh, at, the, at the festival in 2009. I can see like everyone is sitting there enjoying the festival, but there's one guy with dancing. That is a technology enthusiast. He has, he has the, he's thinking of I'm using the AI here and I'm believing it because it's nice and I make fun of it. The rest of the people are thinking, yeah, you're maybe rather a nerd or a bit of a stranger, you know? But he's persistent, he keeps on going, right? He believes in his product. He believes that he is, <laughs> look at that, he keeps on going. But if we wait a little bit, we will see that he's not the only one. <laughs> There's another tech enthusiast. So yeah, another one that believes in the AI. But again, the rest is, is looking there and is looking like, no, 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 not with me. This is looking too strange. I'm not, I'm not doing that. But then if we wait a little bit again, we'll see that they're not just alone. There is a third tech enthusiast coming. And yeah, it becomes already a little party in between the tech enthusiasts. So they're starting also telling to each other what the use of the technology does for them. You see, they're getting even more enthusiastic, I guess. But then it's important, you see the visionaries. They see, like, typically a different behavioral perspective, more in this case, another gender. And they start seeing this, like, yeah, this could be a big party. I want to be part of it. I want to be early. And they start adjusting the technology. 
And because of that, there are multiple uh, visionaires. And then you also see there, I'm not sure whether you've seen him, uh, a well-dressed guy that, uh, that also entered. You could see that as the first pragmatist. So that means when the first pragmatists are onboarding the technology, the catch-22 is solved. You have someone else that is taking it, like someone that looks like a well-dressed person. And then it just explodes. Everyone started being part of the, being part of the party. This is just maybe a, a fun movie, but this is really something that is also by Geoffrey Moore, the, uh, the writer of that book, given as a nice example of how technology is adjusted, adopted in, in, in clinical, in, in, uh, in, the, in the society. And uh, it also holds probably for um, a clinical routine setting. So not going to look at it again. So, if we look at then the two big challenges, uh, trying to overcome the therapeutic inertia in MS and trying to cross the chasm by AI being used by every clinician on the planet to make better treatment decisions. And therefore, also for overcoming the therapeutic inertia, making sure that there is enough expertise, uncertainty has been reduced, awareness on the risk benefit is improved, decision-making training is improved, a patient education, I'm sure we can entered a new era, and that's the era of personalized medicine, where for every patient, every person is on the right treatment at the right time. Thank you very much.